18, she can take that money to buy her first house. Amen. Amen. And God bless you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Amen. Congratulations. Let's give Jesus some praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, let's give Jesus some praise. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. amen. And amen. All right. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Okay, turn with me please in your Bibles to the book of John chapter 14, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26, I read. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, but the comforter or the helper, who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And we are blessed by the reading of God's word. I'm continuing with my message that I have titled, Understanding the Person of the Holy Spirit, and this is part two. Understanding the Person of the Holy Spirit, and this is part two. The Holy Spirit has been given to us by God to help us. He is our helper. He is our comforter. And one of the key things you have to understand is that when God gives you a helper, you have to understand the place of the helper in your life. You have to understand the place of the helper in your life. And if you don't understand the place of the helper, then you begin to abuse this precious helper that God has given to you. So this year, we are on a quest to understand the Holy Spirit because once we understand who the Holy Spirit is, our Christian walk becomes very easy. Our Christian walk becomes what? very easy. Did you know that you cannot even love God without the Holy Spirit? If you want to love God, it takes the Holy Spirit to love God. That's why the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 5, it says the love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts. The love of God. The love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. So even your love for God is predicated on the help of the Holy Spirit. You can't love God by your own physical strength or physical might. The love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us by God to help us. The Holy Spirit has been given to us by God to help us. Last week we learned quite a few things about his, uh, who he is, his nature. We learned a lot about his nature. We, le we learned last week that the Holy Spirit is not just a spirit, but he's a person. He is a person. So today we are going to look at the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a sensitive nature. This means he has feelings that can be affected by the actions of man. Because of the sensitive nature of the Holy Spirit, the Bible warns us that we should not do certain things. And we're going to list some of these things down today. Now, what did I say? The Holy Spirit has a what? A sensitive nature. The Holy Spirit has a what? A sensitive nature. When we say someone or something is sensitive, that means that person or that thing is extremely, extremely sensitive. Amen. Can I just show you that quickly? Can I have one man, one man, and one lady? One lady? One lady? Quickly, please. One man, one lady. Yeah, come. Let's just say uh, this, she's the Holy Spirit, right? But he is not the Holy Spirit. Follow this, it's very important. 
The Bible says that the Holy Spirit has a sensitive nature. Very sensitive. So let's say she is the Holy Spirit. He is just a human being. He is not the Holy Spirit. So now I'm going to demonstrate the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit to you. So that you can take this very, very important. Because we need to establish the foundations of who the Holy Spirit is so that we know him better than we have been taught. Now, I don't want these teachings just to be a theoretical, but it has to be experiential. So the Holy Spirit has a what? A sensitive nature. So this is the Holy Spirit, right? Now, let's say, let's do high five. Now, remember, you are very sensitive. Yes. So, when I give you a tiny high five, I want you to start crying, wailing. <laughs> I want you to do a bit of drama and show me how very painful it is because you are very what? Sensitive. sensitive. Now, I'm going to give you the same high five. I'm going to give her a very short high five. By you, I'll give you a very hard high five but you are very strong because you are not sensitive. Right? All right. So, high five. Do, do proper drama now. Just cry, cry, wail. Can you see? Why? Because she's sensitive. Now, high five. He didn't feel anything. Did you feel anything? No. Because he's not sensitive. Did you get that? Because he's not sensitive. But I give the Holy Spirit a little high five. The Holy Spirit starts screaming and wailing. And you wonder, but ah, it was just a tiny little high five. I give this man a hard high five. He's okay. He's not, there's nothing. He's not shouting. He's not screaming. Why? Because he's not sensitive. But the Holy Spirit is extremely extremely sensitive extremely sensitive there are some words you say to some people and they don't feel anything there is the same word you would say the same thing to someone and you see them crying why because their level of sensitivity is very high amen god bless you thank you let's give jesus some praise so with that analogy and with that understanding I want us to look at a few things. The f one, number one, we must not lie to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he's sensitive, right? We must not lie to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5 from verse 3 to 4. The background of this scripture is that uh, the church in the early days was, was said to everyone, they wanted to destroy poverty and lack in the church. So they ask everyone to bring offering or to bring tithes and offering uh, and, and to, to go and sell stuff and bring them. So everyone, remember at this point, no one was under any pressure or under any duress. We have just been asked to bring our tithes and our offering and our giving. <laughs> and then there was a couple in the church who went and sold their land remember they were not under any pressure or any duress they went and sold their land and then they brought part of what they have sold to the church not to the church but to the pastor because the pastor can see the price at which they sold the property for and remember the property does not belong to the pastor neither did it belong to the church it belonged to them. This is very important. So number one, we must not lie to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. So guess, look at what happened. After they sold the property and they brought the money to Peter, Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Why has Satan done what? Filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, they brought that money to Peter, who was the head of the church. Not to the Holy Spirit. But Peter, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, said, why has Satan filled your heart 
to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? And you have not lied to men, but to God. Do you see how sensitive the Holy Spirit is? So every time, this is why even our giving must be predicated on the direction and on the basis of his word. The Bible says that let everyone give according to the level of God's blessing in their lives. Do you get what I'm saying? Jesus sat by the offering bowl and a lady brought a coin. A poor broke woman. She brought all her, she had, a little piece of coin. And Jesus said she has given more than everyone. There were wealthy people there who were bringing everything. But Jesus looked at this woman and said her giving came from her heart. She understood the concept of giving. Please hear me. Every time you come to church and it's time for giving, you are not giving to the pastor. You are not giving to the church, you are not donating to God. Mm, amen. This is very important. Amen. If you don't get this, you will miss God all the days of your life. So they brought the offering, they divided it, you know, uh, for instance, when, when the last Sunday of every month in this church, it's our Thanksgiving service, right? Mm. And it's a time we come where we thank God for what he's done for us in the month in anticipation for what he'll do in the coming month. So somebody say, the last Sunday we take two offerings. So this Sunday I've decided to give 10 pounds. So you go to the, to the shop and break your 10 pounds into five five pounds because today they are going to take two offerings. Thanksgiving offering five pounds, main offering, Titan offering five pounds. Question, is that what God has done for you? Is that the level of God's blessing in your life? Are you deceiving God or you are deceiving man? The pastor might not have seen you gone through that shop to break your 10 pounds into two. Do you get it? So Ananias and Safari lied to the Holy Ghost, but they thought they were lying to the pastor and the church. This is why in this church, giving is not an issue. But you have to understand that our giving is our covenant with God. Amen. God says when you tithe, I'll open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. So when the time comes for tithes and offering and you are not giving, you are not lying to the pastor. Guess who you are lying to? The Holy Spirit. Because he has a sensitive what? Nature. Remember, last week we said the Holy Spirit can see all things, even the deep things of God. And we did say that the Holy Spirit has the ability, or not the, has the ability, the Holy Spirit searches our mind. He knows what's in your mind. So when you come to church, you're not coming to mark a register. You're not coming for the pastor to see that, oh, he was in church today. No, it's for your own advantage. So number one, we must not lie to the Holy Spirit because he has a sensitive nature. Number two, we must not resist the Holy Spirit. We must not resist the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a specific, has specific ministries on behalf of the believer. Resisting the Holy Spirit is not yielding to him when he tries to minister in your life. You are resist Remember, he's your helper. Don't resist your helper. You know, don't repel your helper. Are you following what I'm saying? When people come close to you, don't repel them. Women will tell you that when they are cooking in the kitchen, all other ingredients is fine, except one ingredient that causes them to cry, which is the onion. So, uh, there was a time Tesco uh, planted certain types of onion that doesn't produce tears. And it became the most popular onions. I think it's still available. Now, 
you are a gift like the onion. But when people come close to you, your gift repels them, not you. Your gift repels them that they begin to cry. Very important. God was specific the type of oil that should be in, in his house, in the temple. God was specific what kind of oil that must be in the house. An oil that burns the lamp. And you know, when the lamp is being burned, sometimes it produces smoke. And the smoke goes into your eyes and it makes you teary. But the kind of oil that God wants in his house is an oil that doesn't produce smoke. So that means when people come close to your gift, your gift should not make them cry. Your gift should not repel them. Have you wondered why some people can't keep friends? They are so gifted yet they can't keep friends. Why? Because they are resisting people. The Holy Spirit is your helper. He's here to help you. When you resist him, he can't help you. You are carrying a heavy load. Your neck is about to break. And somebody comes to help you and you push them away. Whose neck is going to break? Your neck or their neck? Your neck. So resisting the Holy Spirit is not yielding to him when he tries to minister in your life. When he tries to help you, you are resisting him. When he tries to help you, he tells you, do this this way. You don't have to understand him to obey. I always say understanding must wait. Obedience is now. It is better to obey God than want to understand God. How many of you know that God is a good God? And if he's a good God, he will never lead you into something that will destroy your life. Some people have gotten into relationships where the Holy Spirit have told them, please don't, don't. Don't, don't. They resisted the Holy Spirit. They resisted the Holy Spirit, entered into that relationship, and then the end result was worse. But you see, the Holy Spirit doesn't come back and say, I told you so. He still loves you with his loving arms. He wraps it around you. Acts chapter 7 verse 51, the Bible says, you stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. He is here to help you. Remember, he has a sensitive nature. Number three, we must not quench the Holy Spirit. Number three, we must not quench the Holy Spirit. You quench the Holy Spirit when you refuse to do what the Holy Spirit will have you to do. The word quenched is used elsewhere in the Bible in reference to putting out a fire. When you quench the Holy Spirit, it stops the flow of his power within you. It is like throwing water on fire. You are not a fire service. Stop quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit. Stop quenching. And sometimes, even in church, that's why we have to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are sometimes, maybe whoever is ministering has all of a sudden changed. They were ministering powerfully. The Holy Spirit was flowing, and then all of a sudden, they changed the key. And when they changed the key, the keyboardist could not flow with that key. And what happens? The Holy Spirit is quenched right there. The Holy Spirit is about to do something unusual in the life of someone. And then all of a sudden, the fire is quenched. That's why we have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Extremely sensitive. Extremely sensitive. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 19. It says, do not quench the spirit. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 19. Do not do what? Quench the Holy Spirit. 
quenching the Holy Spirit is not doing what the Holy Spirit would have us do. Stop quenching. You have been Mr. Quencher for too long. You have been Miss or Mrs. Quencher for too long. Stop quenching the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit has a, set, a sensitive nature that he operates greatly in an environment where it's in an atmosphere of absolute peace. Do you remember the man, uh, I think in Mark chapter 8, who was blind? That Jesus had to heal him. The Bible says that Jesus took him out of the town or out of the village. Jesus took him out. Why? Because the environment was not conducive. So do not quench the Holy Spirit. Number four, we must not grieve the Holy Spirit. Number four, we must not grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieving the Holy Spirit is doing something that the Holy Spirit does not, capital letter, not want us to do. The nation of Israel grieved the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 78 verse 14, the Bible says, How often they, prov they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him on the desert. How often? That means their nature was to just grieve the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they entered into a habitual grieving of the Holy Spirit. We must not grieve the Holy Spirit. What is associated with grief? Loss. So every time you grieve the Holy Spirit, guess who is losing? Not the Holy Spirit. You are the one losing. We must not grieve the Holy Spirit. The children of God on the desert constantly, 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 they were putting pressure on, on Moses constantly. We need water. Give us water. Moses had to strike the rock twice. And as a result of that, he was prevented from going into the promised land. Putting pressure on Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? Is it because there are no graves? They are talking about graves, where they are going to be buried. As if when you die, you know where you are buried. Why? They preferred bondage to freedom. The Holy Spirit gave them freedom and they said, no, we don't want it. Why are you bringing us here? The Bible says that for 40 years they were walking on the wilderness and they did not lack shoe. They did not lack clothes. They did not lack food. And yet, they were saying, what kind of food is this? What is this manna? What is this? Why are you giving us this? Constantly grieving the Holy Spirit. Constantly grieving God. You see, we are living in a generation where we say it's a, it's a, it's a dispensation of grace. Praise God. I believe it. But the, the dispensation of grace does not stop the execution of other laws. You can't say you are under grace, so all laws are suspended. We are under grace, yet the law of gravity is still in operation. How many of you know that? If you jump from a 10-story building, you have justice with concrete justice. So we must not grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30, the Bible says that do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is our sealer. He seals us. And every time you grieve the Holy Spirit, you are taking the seal away. And when you take the seal away, guess what? You are open for the devil to destroy you. Why are you taking the seal? He sealed you unto redemption. He sealed you unto salvation. He sealed you unto blessing. He sealed you unto joy. Why are you taking the seal away? You take the seal away every time you grieve him. Every time you grieve the Holy Spirit, you've taken the seal away. 
the seal of protection, the seal of provision, the seal of, 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 of goodness and mercy. Every time you grieve the Holy Spirit, you have taken away the seal from yourself. And guess who is hurt? You, not the Holy Spirit. He just moves away. Remember, he's gentle. He's sensitive. He doesn't force himself on us. Praise God. Number five, we must not insult the Holy Spirit. Are you getting something out of this? So I say, how do I insult the Holy Spirit? You wait, you see. You insult the Holy Spirit by going back into the sin, into sin, after you have experienced forgiveness through the blood of Jesus. You insult the Holy Spirit by going back. It's like a dog going back to its vomit. You have been delivered out of sin and you go back. That is insulting the Holy Spirit. It's like a pig taken out of a mud and bath and nicely clothed. <laughs> nicely clothed. And then <laughs> you put the pig in a palace. <laughs> and then you go, you go out shopping by the time you come. With that expensive clothes, the pig goes back into the mud, muddying himself. That's insulting everything the person has done for you. Hallelujah. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. Let's go there. 10 to Hebrews 10 29. I want to read. I want to show you something very powerful. Are you getting something out of this? After today you get to know the Holy Spirit much more better. And then it helps you to relate with him better. Isn't that right? Yes. I said, isn't that right? Yes. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. I read. It says, of how much worse punishment, punishment do you suppose will be will be thought worthy who has tram tram trampled the son of God underfoot counter the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace did you see that of how much sora punishment See, 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 see what the Holy Spirit is saying. Of how much sorrow punishment. Punishment. Suppose ye shall he thought worthy. Who has trodden underfoot the son of God. And has counted the blood of the covenant. Wherewith he has sanctified an unholy thing. And has done despite unto the spirit of grace. Hallelujah. Sorrow punishment. Every time you go back, every time you go back, you are insulting the Holy Spirit. You've been redeemed from a certain sin. Every time you go back, you are insulting the Holy Spirit. It's a, it's of a Bible says it's of a sorrow punishment. Hallelujah. It's time to stop insulting the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 4 to 6. Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 4 to 6. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Oh, this is powerful. 
I don't have the time to explain this, but hopefully you go home and, and, and go through them yourself. Partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame. So every time you go back, you're crucifying Jesus again for what he already died for. And guess what the Bible says? It says you have put him to an open shame. You put Jesus to an open shame. That's why unbelievers look at us and they say, mm -mm. this person calls himself or herself a Christian. I don't think I want to be a Christian. Open shame. Number six, we must not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We do number seven and we'll close. Number six, we must not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It says, wherefore I say unto you, Matthew chapter 12 from verse 31 to 32. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Ah, this is serious. Now remember, this is Jesus speaking. This next verse, it says, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Mm. <laughs> so is it possible that some people will go to heaven and have their sins unforgiving? <laughs> because they have blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. They said evil things against the Holy Spirit. Blasphemed, did all kinds of things. That's why if you don't understand something, don't criticize it. Yeah? If you don't understand it, something, don't try to explain it or criticize it. You might not know you are just blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit has been called the unpardonable sin. Because according to the passage, it is the one sin for which there is no forgiveness. To blaspheme means to speak abusive words which rejects the power of the Holy Spirit as being of God and claim it is of Satan. If a person totally rejects the power of the Holy Spirit, then he can never be saved because it is the Holy Spirit which draws sinful men to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit produces many visible confirming signs of God's power. Jesus was saying that if a person could not accept the miraculous signs as a proof of the truth of the gospel, then what could ever possibly convince them to believe? So every time you criticize and, and misrepresent and misinterpret what you don't understand in the church, you are possibly on the verge of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And remember, that's the only sin which is unpardonable. It's unforgivable. If you sin against me, I'll forgive you. Now, why would you sin against God? Who is your helper? Like we put it, you don't bite the finger that feeds you. The last one, as we close, we must not vex the Holy Spirit. We must not vex the Holy Spirit. To vex the Holy Spirit means to irritate, annoy, provoke, or make angry. The Holy Spirit is vexed by the disobedience and unbelief of mankind. 
the prophet Isaiah records what happened to God's people, Israel, when they vexed the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 63 verse 10. It says, they, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. So every time you vex the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit becomes your enemy and God begins to fight against you. The God who is supposed to fight on your behalf is fighting against you. The Holy Spirit has an extremely sensitive nature. Extremely sensitive. That's why you know the story in Acts chapter 5 Ananias and Sapphira, they were killed. Did you know that? They died. They died instantly. The Holy Spirit killed them instantly. That's how sensitive the Holy Spirit is. And in this day and age, we might not die physically, but certain things in our lives has died. Certain things you're wondering, why am I struggling in this area of my life? Because probably you have grieved the Holy Spirit probably you have vexed the Holy Spirit and God is against what you're doing and for life, if instead of coming to a point of acknowledging and repenting, you continue in it. If you're a Christian and almost every area of your life is working and one particular area is not working, then you have to sit down and start asking questions. As Even as a human being, there are things I like, there are things I don't like. I don't, I, I, I like order. I, I don't like disorder. When, 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 when we're in church, I don't like disorder. Do you get me? That's me, a human being. I don't like.